What's the difference between DSM-4 and DSM-5? In DSM-4, we were terribly concerned about diagnostic inflation. And so we established very high thresholds for making changes. We didn't want to expand the system anymore. To keep the experts in check, we said you have to have very careful literature review, data reanalysis, field trial results, all very convincing that this new diagnosis will be helpful more than it will be harmful. It turned out we had 94 suggestions for new diagnoses, and we accepted only two. We wanted not to be different. We wanted to constrain the growth of psychiatric diagnosis, not expand it. DSM-5 started with very, very powerful ambitions. It wanted to be a paradigm shift in psychiatry. And so it gave the experts complete freedom. It said, everything's on the table. Be innovative. And they were. If you let experts control the diagnostic system, they will always expand it. I've been working with experts for 35 years. I've never had one expert come up and say, you know, I think my diagnostic area is too expanded. Why don't we constrain it? They always want to expand. They always think about their own practice. They work in research clinics. They have lots of time with each patient. It's a lot of expertise in the problem. The things they write into the manual may make sense for them, but can be disastrous in average practice, especially with drug company influence. And so DSM-5, in expanding the system, has made what's the current diagnostic inflation um, it runs the risk that the current diagnostic inflation will become diagnostic hyperinflation and that even more people will be inappropriately diagnosed and inappropriately treated. In the preface of your book, Saving Normal, you say the book is both a mea culpa and a jacuzzi. Can you explain why? I said more than that. I said mea culpa, jacuzzi, and cri de coeur. <laughs> okay. I was showing off <laughs> my, my, my uh, knowledge of other languages, which doesn't extend far beyond that. Um, it's a mea culpa because we thought when we completed the SM4 that we had held back diagnostic inflation. We thought we did a good job. It turned out that there have been three epidemics since the SM4. An epidemic of, um, in the US, an epidemic of attention deficit disorder, an epidemic of autism, and an epidemic of bipolar disorder. Um, bipolar disorder has doubled in the U.S. in these years. I think it's very gone up here a lot as well. Um, autism has gone up by 40 times, and attention deficit disorder has tripled. So we thought we were containing diagnostic inflation, but we failed. That's the mea culpa. We didn't anticipate just how powerful the pharmaceutical industry could be. And uh, three years after DSM-4 was published, they got the right in the United States. It's absolutely amazing. They can advertise directly to consumers. So imagine watching TV or reading the internet and seeing constant ads for mental illness. This has pushed the sales of drugs tremendously. They've given people the notion that um, every mental disorder is a chemical imbalance and that the cure for a chemical imbalance is to take their chemical, their pill. And that psychiatric diagnosis is easy to do, very much um, under-recognized, and primary care physicians can quickly, after seven minutes, make a decision about a diagnosis and prescribe a medicine. 80% of the medicine prescribed for psychiatric patients in America, 80% of psychiatric medicines prescribed by non-psychiatrists, usually after seven minutes. I think that we thought that we were containing diagnostic inflation, we were, and that's the mea culpa. The um, jacques is that, um, to two things, one, the drug industry, which has so outrageously misled the public and doctors, uh, into over-prescribing medication for problems of everyday life. And two, the DSM-5, that instead of containing diagnostic inflation, it's opened the floodgates, and there'll be more and more normal people. In the United States, millions, maybe tens of millions of normal people will get diagnoses they don't need and receive treatments that may do more harm than good. And the creed occurs, it's a very sad thing, especially in America, that we have this terrible paradox. We're over-diagnosing and over-treating, people don't need it. At the same time, we're terribly neglecting the severely mentally ill who desperately need help. We've closed a million psychiatric beds in the United States in the last 15 years, similar to the deinstitutionalization in Italy. 
but there's been a huge difference. In Italy, the money went to taking care of, money saved by reduced hospitalization, went to taking care of patients in the community and giving them a decent place to live. And the best care for patients, I've seen in the whole world, is in Italy, for a severely ill patient. That you've done much more in treating with dignity people with severe mental illness than anyone else I've seen in the world. In the United States, it's been just the opposite. The money that was saved in closing the beds wasn't spent on good community treatment. It was spent in a very strange way. We closed one million psychiatric beds. We opened one million prison beds for patients, for psychiatric patients, who commit nuisance crimes, not particularly violent, nuisance crimes. There's no place for them to go to be treated as an outpatient. Very poor housing. The police arrive with first, arrive as first responders. They know that if they take them to a psychiatric emergency room, they won't get admitted. They won't get an appointment. They take them to jail instead. We have one million psychiatric patients in prison. It's an absolute disgrace. They're vulnerable. They get disproportionately put in solitary confinement, which drives them even crazier. They also get raped a lot. Um, 200,000 rapes a year in U.S. prisons, and the majority of them psychiatric patients. So we're treating the most disadvantaged of the mentally ill uh, with neglect and with coercive imprisonment. It's like the Middle Ages, um, worse than the Middle Ages. Um, and at the same time, we're way over treating people who would get well on their own. We're spending $18 billion a year on antipsychotics, $12 billion a year on antidepressants, $7 billion a year on stimulant drugs. We should be spending the money where it's needed for the people who are really sick. We shouldn't be over-treating people who are well. So that's the creative curve. Okay, thanks. Uh, the SM5 had the great ambition, or the exaggerated ambition as you wrote, of changing the psychiatric diagnosis paradigm, introducing a neuroscience contribution, prevention, and dimensional assessment. But it failed. Why? Well, for biological measures, you can't say, I want to have biological measures and expect that they'll just appear. It, um, the brain is the most complicated thing in the known universe. We have as many neurons in our little three-pound brains as there are stars in the galaxy, 100 billion. Each of these is connected to 1,000 other neurons. Each of them fires 1,000 times a second. And to get in place, they've gone through a weird choreography, a very complicated cellular migration, and connecting up in the right place. It's an amazingly complex system. Um, we are understanding gradually how normal brains work, but we have not yet found any way of providing biological tests for psychiatric disorders. We're very far from that. Um, it's been very difficult with breast cancer that we 20 years ago found a gene for breast cancer, but we still understand very little about breast cancer. The breast is the simplest organ in the human body. The brain is the most complicated thing in the whole universe. It's going to be very long before we get a biological understanding of psychiatric disorder. There won't be one schizophrenia. There'll be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of causes of schizophrenia. We shouldn't assume that we can have a biological revolution in psychiatric diagnosis and treatment before the time has come, and it hasn't come yet. So DSM-5 failed on that because the field wasn't ready. It was a ridiculous ambition. The dimensional ambition was a useful one. Um, numbers are better at na than, than names at describing things whenever you can provide a, a, a number. Um, but human brains don't think that way. Computers think in numbers. We think in names. Statistics was one of the last things that developed in terms of uh, mathematical uh, disciplines. And uh, when Adam was asked to take the million of the animals, he named them. He didn't give them numbers. This is a navy blue shirt. That's really a very vague description of this shirt, but it serves our purposes. Um, if you're doing a physics experiment, you'd want to have the wavelength of this shirt. That would be much more accurate. The problem is it's much more complicated to think in wavelengths. And human minds don't do that. Clinicians don't think in numbers. They think in names. Psychologists more numbers than, than psychiatrists. DSM tried to develop dimensional diagnoses, especially for personality disorders. This is a very good idea. Um, 
One of the first papers I wrote more than 30 years ago was on dimensional versus categorical diagnosis of personality disorders. And 20 years ago, we wrote a paper saying personality disorder dimensions not whether, just when. It's clear that dimensional approaches to personality are superior because personality sort of melds imperceptibly, personality disorder melds imperceptibly into normality, into access one conditions, into situational stress problems. So that it doesn't have clear boundaries. And whenever you don't have clear boundaries, um, numbers are better than names because names imply you have it or you don't. Black and white, no shades of gray. Dimensions allow for shades of gray. The trouble is that DSM-5 people got involved in developing such a complicated system of dimensions that no one except the people working on it ever understood it. It was never tested. It was a shot in the dark. And it was so um, poorly done that eventually, at the last moment, it was excluded from the official nomenclature. And the DSM-5 is exactly the same as DSM-4. The personality disorder. It would have been a lot smarter and better to have a very simple dimensional system that would have been a gradual transition to get people used to it, rather than trying to do something so revolutionary and so unproven and so ad hoc that finally just had to be abandoned. The third thing, um, these first two things have not caused permanent damage. So the fact that there are no biological measures in DSM-5, that's to be expected. I'm not ready yet. The fact that dimensional measures weren't included is unfortunate, but it's not going to harm patients. No one's going to die because there's uh, not a dimensional measure in DSM-5. The third innovation, the third attempt at a paradigm shift will have lasting damage, I think. And that was to try to introduce a kind of preventive psychiatry. Milder disorders. So we have grief now turned into major depressive disorder. We have worries about, you know, your physical health, if you have cancer, say, turned into somatic symptom disorder. My troubles remembering things, uh, now that I'm 71 years old, becomes minor neurocognitive disorder. My desire to eat every one of those cookies and everything else in this hotel that has wonderful Italian flavors, binge eating disorder. Um, my grandchildren's temper tantrums become disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And um, pretty soon everyone's going to have attention deficit disorder. They were defining down the different definitions of mental disorder, making it easier for normal people to be mislabeled as having a mental disorder. Why? The idea was to follow medicine. And in medicine for the last 30 years, there's been a desire to diagnose early and treat expectantly. The idea being that if you can get there early and prevent the problem, that's better than letting the problem develop. It'll be easier to do prevention than treatment and that we can reduce the burden of illness by early intervention. This is a great idea on paper. It's often a terrible idea in practice. And we're finding in the rest of medicine a revolution against early intervention because it turns out very often to be much more harmful than helpful. Um, there's a, your listeners, viewers should look up something called Choosing Wisely on Google. This is an effort by 10 American specialty associations in medicine identify those tests and those treatments that are being overdone. The British Medical Journal is very active now in trying to correct the tendency of journals to always publish positive findings, to always encourage more treatment, focusing on overdiagnosis and overtreatment in medicine in general. Psychiatry in DSM-5 is getting on the bandwagon of prevention, just as the rest of medicine is realizing it's been way oversold that very often the prevention efforts cause more harm than good. Men who used to always get the recommendation to do prostate testing, now are told not to do it unless they have special risk factors because the treatment for the prostate cancers was worse than the cancer. So DSM-5 has introduced all of these new conditions. None of them has been tested well. All of them will mislabel normal people because the definitions are so easy to make. Um, in no instance, none of the new suggestions of DSM-5 is an effective treatment. And in many instances, the diagnosis may be treated with medications that are quite dangerous. So we already have a fad of attention deficit disorder. DSM-5 will extend that fad. People who don't need it will get stimulant medication. And many of the other conditions also have these kinds of risks. Uh, speaking of paradigms change, uh, 
Uh, as you told, it seemed had to be a bigger revolution about personality disorder and cism, uh, which created a debate regarding the transition from a categorical to a um, dimensional system, and regarding which disorders should be eliminated. But as you told uh, before, in the end, nothing has changed because uh, in the SM5 uh, we read that the criteria for personality disorders in the section two have not changed from those in the SM4, and an alternative approach. Uh, to the diagnosis of personality disorders was developed for further studies or for research. In your opinion, is this good or bad for clinical psychology and psychiatry? Well, I think it's a lost opportunity and it gives dimensions a bad name. So that done well, if the simple dimensions had been included in DSM-5, that would have been a step forward towards teaching clinicians and patients to think in terms of shades of gray, yeah. not just black and white. Done poorly, it's a lost opportunity. And the worst part of it is it may discourage people in the future from including dimensions in the system. And these are really a more accurate way of describing people because by and large, we don't have sharp boundaries between normal and abnormal. But there are shades of gray and numbers can describe these better than names can. Thanks. Two years ago, during a Lezio Magistralis in Milan, Professor Otto Kemper was discussing about the new personality disorders conceptualization proposed by the SM5, and he stated, let me say that the American classification system pretends to be a scientific system. It's not. It's a political system and reflects the vigorism of the ideological commitment of the American Psychiatric Association. What's your opinion? Well, I don't get carried away sometimes. It's neither, it's neither a scientific system nor is it just a political system. It's a clinical system. Um, descriptive psychiatry is not the best way of describing people. It would be much better if we had a basic and fundamental understanding of the biological, the psychological, and the social forces that go into creating mental illness. But we don't. So at this point, we do a very simple thing. We take the, the very most superficial descriptions of a person and we categorize based on that. We do this because it's the best we have. It's not great, but it's the best we have. And it's a fact that having a system of, of um, descriptions, of definitions, that allows for reliability across um, the clinical, um, that allows clinicians to communicate with one another, allows communication across the clinical research interface, all of this is limited but valuable. I wouldn't trust someone who just believed the DSM diagnosis and didn't try to find out a lot more about the person and the social context than these very simple criteria. Anyone who just focuses on this, these criteria is doing a very incomplete job of understanding human beings. And Hippocrates said, um, it's more important to know the patient who has the disease than the disease the patient has. We need to understand our patients, not just categorize them in simple DSM. Terms. On the other hand, people who don't know DSM, I think I wouldn't trust them either. That it's important to understand the things that people have in common when we do an evaluation. It's an equally important to understand the things that make them individual and, and uh, special in their own way. And a DSM diagnosis is the first step in a clinical evaluation, an essential step, but it shouldn't be the only step. Speaking of personality disorder, Professor Kemper said that DSM-5's development was strongly influenced by the conflict between clinical psychiatrists and experimental psychologists, and by the tendency to a radical neurobiological view within American psychiatry. He stated that this, is, this view is largely influenced by psychopharmacological industry that looks for neurobiological features that permit the treatment of symptoms by medication affecting the central nervous system. What do you think about that? Uh, are they trying to medicalize personality disorders too? Well, I think Otto tends to see things in black and white. He's not very dimensional. I think that um, the best model in all our work is a biopsychosocial model that recognizes that the brain is important, especially with some people with severe illness, that the psychology is very influential in how symptoms developed and how they should be treated, and the social context is often vital. These are, this is a tripod that stands best with three legs. And when you take away any one or two of the legs, you get into trouble. 
Um, the NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health in the United States, has criticized DSM because it's not biological enough. And it wants to switch to a, a strictly biomedical paradigm of psychiatric disorders. Silly idea. The um, American Psychological Association and the British Psychological Society have suggested that we abandon the biological model, abandon psychiatric diagnosis, and focus just on psychosocial factors, which may make sense for some mild illnesses, but it's completely wrongheaded when it comes to severe disorders, which have a strong biological complement. Anyone who wants to shift paradigms, it should be suspect. The biopsychosocial paradigm is imperfect and complete, but it's the best we have. I think that the uh, problem in the United States has been that the psychiatrists have tended to move towards a more biomedical paradigm. The psychologists have tended to move more towards a psychosocial paradigm. Uh, both of these are wrong-headedly incomplete. The three things need to be joined together to really under understand patients well. I think the idea that the drug companies are influencing the DSM, I think it's wrong. That the drug companies my experience have no influence in what's actually written. But the people, the experts, have an intellectual conflict of interest. I don't think they have a financial conflict of interest. I don't think the people working on DSM-5 made suggestions that I consider to be very dangerous. I don't think they did it for a financial conflict of interest to help the drug companies. But they do have an intellectual conflict of interest. That every expert thinks his area is more important than uh, the attention it receives always wants to expand its, the area. And I think that the uh, pharmaceutical industry is already taking advantage of the SM5. It's already uh, telling doctors that grief is often major depressive disorder. Um, recently I saw that um, a drug that's been used for um, attention deficit disorder is now being studied and, uh, quote, effective for binge eating disorder. Now, that an appetite suppressant, that stimulants are appetite suppressant, no great news. But the fact that binge eating disorder is in the DSM will allow that pharmaceutical company to, to take their stimulant drug, which is being overused for attention deficit disorder, and now have it be overused for binge eating disorder. So I think the DSM is easily misused by the pharmaceutical industry. I think that's a big problem. I think it's part of why we've had these epidemics, a large part of why we've had the epidemics. And I think the solution is to stop drug company marketing, just stop their marketing because it's misleading bad for patients. But I don't think the people working at DSM are too influenced by that. Um, if you had been the DSM-5 task force chairman, which changes would you have made um, toward DSM-4? I think I would have said our biggest problem now is our system is being overused. How can we tighten it? It would have been great to have black box warnings for the many diagnoses that are being uh, overused by clinicians and um, leading to too much treatment. Um, things like childhood bipolar disorder, which DSM-4 rejected, but because thought leaders and drug companies pushed it, became 40 times more common. Um, and a huge amount of excessive medication for kids that makes them fat. Uh, tremendous weight gains, 10% weight gains in 12 weeks. For a diagnosis that we wouldn't even include, just pushed by thought leads, I would have said, let's take the DSM and look disorder by disorder, figure out which ones are likely overdiagnosed, give a warning ca caution, indicate the proper diagnosis to try to um, suppress diagnostic inflation. I think that um, the biggest problem that comes all the way from DSM-3 was major depressive disorder. As it's defined in DSM since 1980, it's often not major, it's often not depressive, it's often not disorder. Um, this was because in DSM-3 there was a linking together of the very mildest depressions, which are usually situational, and the very most severe melancholic and delusional depressions, which have a strong biological component. These were put together in one category with the, the notion that the differences within the category would be expressed by subtyping. We had a subtype for melancholia, a subtype for delusional depression, and also by severity ratings. What the drug company succeeded in doing was to lump these together as if major depressive disorder were one entity, that anyone who qualified for the major depressive disorder is easy to qualify for, where you need a sadness, loss of interest, loss of energy, loss of appetite, and trouble sleeping for two weeks, big deal, easy to get. The, the people who have the situational depressions 
shouldn't be lumped together in the same category with the people who have the very severe melancholic and delusional depressions. And I would have tried to separate these out, uh, taking away the ability of the drug companies to say these are all chemical imbalances. In the United States, we have 11% of our population on antidepressants. 25% of women over 40 are on antidepressant. Depression is being overdiagnosed in the mildly ill and overtreated, partly because of this DSM defect. At the same time, only one third of people with severe depressions sees a mental health clinician in the previous year. So I would want to focus the diagnostic system more on the severe disorders that are often missed, with less distraction, with milder presentations, which are really part of everyday life, part of their malady. Which are exaggerated. You wrote DSM 5 brings a severe danger, the hyperinflation of diagnosis. In your book, you strongly remark the role played by Big Pharma. But don't you think that going against Big Pharma is just fighting uh, windmills, uh, just a waste of time? It's a David and Goliath battle. But David won. <laughs> yeah. David right. recently won. Uh, the battle with Big Tobacco was very similar. Big Tobacco was absolutely powerful, and the people opposing it had almost no budget. But they won. That, um, every once in a while, not often, but every once in a while, right does make for money. And I think if the drug companies were prevented from advertising and marketing in the way they do, it would tremendously cut their, their uh, power and their sales. They're already leaving psychiatry to a large degree. Their research efforts are being much reduced because they're finding out it's not easy to come up with new drugs that we haven't really had um, more effective drugs uh, for 60 years. That the first drugs in each family, each of whom, which was developed not by drug companies, but by accidental observations. A, a French surgeon gave patients Thorazine so that they wouldn't throw up during the um, operations. They calmed down. He suggested to his brother-in-law that maybe this would be a good tranquilizer, and that's how Thorazine came about. Lithium came out from experiments with guinea pigs, an accidental finding that it calmed them down. The um, antidepressants started because they were related to TB drugs that seemed to cheer patients up. The, the initial drugs are 60, 65 years old now. We've never come up with more effective drugs in this whole period of time. And I think the um, drug companies have made a fortune on psychiatric drugs, and they're just now realizing that there's nothing powerful in the pipeline. What we need to do is not expect miracles. I don't think that there will be miraculous new findings in the next 10 or 20 years on the biology of mental illness. I don't think there will be miraculous new drugs. We had very effective drugs, very effective psychotherapies. We're just not applying them well in the right places. We need to figure out the patients who do best with our treatments and focus on them with an attention that makes sure that their, their uh, biological, psychological, and social needs are met. And we need to stop mislabeling normal people and giving them treatments that will cause them more harm than good. Uh, in your book, you not only attack Big Pharma, but you also blame the American Psychiatric Association and the way the SM5 was developed. Any reaction from them? Did you get any criticism, any answers? Well, it's a funny thing. I, I've lost friends. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> a lot of the people working on DSM-5 were friends, and I hope they uh, very much liked my, my criticisms. Um, almost everyone who I speak to about this, and I guess most of the people viewing this, realizes that this is obvious. It's common sense. There's nothing I'm saying that's not absolute common sense. Uh, the only people who don't understand this, and I've tried convincing them, are the experts working at DSF-5. That when you're an expert, you don't realize how your ideas will be misused in the real world. Very often they'd say to me, you know, I'm just working on the science. If this idea, which I, th I know is going to be helpful for people um, who use it well, if it's used badly, that's a problem of education. That's not my problem. Um, I don't see it that way. I think that the manual, DSM has tremendous influence, way too much influence, in how people are treated and how their lives will be lived. And it, it's very important that we protect against the possibilities of misuse. If people's lives will be harmed, by getting medicine they don't need, that's much more important than a researcher not having his ambition filled to have a new diagnosis in the book. And so, to me, my jacques is that the American Psychiatric Association 
was way too insensitive to the risks and what it was doing. It was focusing only on possible benefits. And the way the real world works, the manual is likely to do much more harm than good. Uh, what are the expectations for a psychiatrist's future? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? I'm tremendously optimistic. I think that there's no field in the um, of human endeavor that's more interesting than psychiatry. It's the only part of medicine that really has kept a humanistic uh, approach. It's lost some of it, but it still has a substantial um, feeling for the, the person, not just the illness. I think that it, it's intellectually fascinating because we're finding out in very small steps, but nonetheless progressive steps, how the brain makes mind. That this relationship between the brain, the social context, and our psychological functioning is about as interesting uh, a, a topic as anything in the world. I think that psychiatry does best when it does what it does best, and that's working with the people who have moderate to severe problems. Um, we go out on the limb and do harm when we try to extend our boundaries into normality and act as if the um, everyday problems of life that are an inevitable part of, of human existence are all mental disorders. So I would see psychiatry, I think it will react against the DSM-5 fiasco. I think the rest of medicine is reacting against overdiagnosis and overtreatment in each of the specialties. Psychiatry will also do that. And that once we practice um, what we do best with the people who need us most, we can do great good, and it's tremendously interesting intellectually, and it's tremendously gratifying in a personal way when you can help someone. And very few specialties have the opportunity, very few professions have the opportunity to help people as much as psychiatrists do. So I'm very high in the profession, very low in DSM-5. Okay. Thank you. Let's hope for DSM-6. Oh, no. <laughs> Enough DSMs, maybe. <laughs>